Alright, hi everybody and welcome to the official Body Spartan Podcast. My name is Gabe Tuft, I am the founder of Body Spartan and your host for the next hour and uh, the usual zoo crew is not here, it's been replaced by uh, the Brocast crew. Oh, we're live with the one and only, your favorite ginger of course, and we have a very special bro here tonight. Oh, yes, and you guys all know him. You do. By his hashtag. By his hashtag. The special hashtag. The special special. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, fuck you, Brandon. (laughs) (laughs) Fuck you, Brandon. All right. All right. Brandon Ambassador, Brandon Griffith is here with us tonight. He's done uh, fighting. You've been fighting 50,000 acre fires in Southern California for three and a half weeks. Mm -hmm. How the hell do you stay so ripped, bro? Well, uh, mostly good lighting and tight t-shirts and uh, <laughs> yes, exactly. If you could see what how he actually was doing how right he was now with his mouth talking into the mic. I, I was telling you to talk into the oh, mic. Oh, is that right? Oh, you're so used sorry. To, if you're used to people, you know, giving right, that, that right, cue. Being right there. Yeah, yes, that's, that's absolutely. Awesome. So it's fine. Yeah, so, that's definitely one of the secrets. Uh, it. <laughs> uh, so guess what, guys? Uh, today we're going to be talking about something very interesting. We are doing this broadcast. Uh, talking about the four what are we calling this thing the four keys to unlocking your potential that's Mm -hmm, what we're calling mm -hmm. it and we are actually currently unlocking our potential with uh three glasses uh of ice and johnny walker black black label in front of us the old can't tell you how quickly that unlocks your potential i don't know whose Um, idea this was i don't know what you're talking about i'm drinking uh bcaa's Uh, uh, johnny walker flavor Mm -hmm. (laughs) just came out just came (laughs) out. it's brand new (laughs) it's by optimum yeah, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it keeps you optimum alcoholics. <laughs> uh, keeps you super hydrated and uh, cuts the edge off. Totally. Yes, yeah, it's yes. it's great. We've actually we've all had a long day, and it, one of the things that we preach is that you know you have to live life a little bit. Mm-hmm. And we've had a long fucking day. Everybody here worked except Brandon. So fuck you, Brandon. How I worked all day. I time? worked all day. One more time. Go Brandon ahead. fucked himself all day. <laughs> <laughs> and slacked off at the gym. You know what? I, was, I, on, I honestly was felt bad earlier when I like farted in your uh, in your protein shake. It but wasn't a protein it, shake. What was it? It was a fucking burger. Oh yeah, he puts his. It was I was sitting on the counter and he was like clean. cooking it up, and He's I was sitting on my countertop, and I just let it go. It was great. Like, it was great. A, just a giant squeaker, bro. Yeah. No, right on my counter. Honestly, did you taste? Did you taste his I fart could, on your burger? He could taste the fart. No, he tasted me. It was unbelievable. I might as well look at me. But he tasted me. <laughs> I'm a little jealous. I don't know. Like I'm like half tilt right now. But um, speaking of burgers, I had a burger last night. You know, dude, burgers have just been like the craze right now. Like they're always a good source of protein to go to. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, kept it really clean. Like uh, I've been doing. You know, high. Like it's funny. We talked to Chris yesterday. We were talking about the whole like complex carbs and, oh, yeah. and protein. Chris right? And uh, dude, I swear, like that's all it is. I was like, how do I make this burger and only keep it protein and complex carbs? So I had sweet potatoes and and the burger and the veggies, no cheese. Kept no the cheese, fat no, no bacon, no guacamole. No ba- oh, so you're from you, on the man. wagon burger. Yeah, dude, it was on the wagon. That's so that hard. was like That's that was like my burger before it became infested with Brandon's farts. <laughs> it was literally, you know, the Costco pre-made burgers. <laughs> mm-hmm. I had drained the fat out of them. I had served myself two up on two pieces of like wheat bread. How many ounces of meat is that roughly? Uh, there is, uh, there's 28 grams of protein. I think it's like. So I think there's grams, seven, so. there's seven or eight ounce burgers. So each. yeah, I would say that's about seven ounces because it's about four it's grams. It's too much. Per. It's too much protein, and so I usually do about a burger and a half is what I end up doing. I can't eat the whole well, thing. Well, because then it, I just feel ill. Well, you just made me feel bad because what yeah, I did right. is I went and bought a pound of burger meat and made two burgers. Me consuming about seventy five percent of that pound, so I had like a three quarter pounder. Or well, that's why you look like you do, and Gabe looks like he does. Oh, uh, so what are you saying? You better be saying I look damn good. Or you better be saying that I look like a monster and he's small as fuck. That's exactly what I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> You're small. Howard, the only place I'm small is what you in your pants. Yes. Right now. <laughs> Got him. <laughs> Damn it, Howard! I can't take you anywhere. Feels good. Feels good. Son of a bitch. All right. So, so mm, moving scotch, on. Scotch, yes. scotch, 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 scotch. So as we're drinking our Johnny Walker, we're going to yes. be talking about uh, the four keys to unlocking your potential. And guys, this is. I think this is going to be one of our better podcasts, not only because we have some good energy here tonight, and when the three of us 
fuck faces get together. <laughs> you never know what to expect. You guys are going to learn a lot. Hopefully, you're going to get motivated. Hopefully, you walk away being entertained, but also retaining uh, a whole hell of a lot of knowledge that we're about to lay down on you. So let's move into it. We've, right. got, we've got these four keys. The first key to unlocking your potential is shattering your self-limiting <coughs> beliefs. And Believe this is something that piece. we've... <laughs> this is echo. <laughs> <laughs> shattering your self-limiting beliefs. Beliefs, beliefs. <laughs> 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 The idea here, guys, is that we are all born. Well, we're not born, but we are. We're given these self-limiting beliefs. We, we're born limitless. There, there was a, one of the first videos we made was the, the "You Are Born Limitless" video, and mm-hmm. we clipped together a bunch of stuff. And and really, you know, they did this study, and I don't think I told you guys about this. We read this pretty pretty recently. Probably not. I don't think so because we're actually anything. considering you know what to do with Mia. Her her school's coming up, so she's got school in two weeks, and we're public like, school. Do we put her? In, I don't want to put her in public school. I want to homeschool her somewhere. I want to put her in a private school. But like the options are getting really thin. So actually, we're talking about starting our own school. And here's why. So for about 20 years, I believe this was, uh, scientists followed a, a group of kids and they created this aptitude test where basically, did you guys just touch fingers under no, the, okay, the keep talking? Just dude. keep talking. Did you touch you touch fingers okay. under the table? Will you please? Are you trying to start, start talking? talking? Yeah. What is what the? Fuck? What are you doing? Talk I'm trying to lay some knowledge Talk down. Talk about bro. your school. I am trying to lay some knowledge down here. Okay, no, but anyway, the study yeah. was showing that. So they created this aptitude test where basically they gave it to kids that were in preschool, and it was a way to determine if they were geniuses or not. And <clears> some <throat> crazy number, and I, I'm, I apologize for not having the study present and knowing the exact number, so I'm paraphrasing. Some crazy high percentage, like 95% of these kids scored in the genius range. So they weren't in public schools. These were pre public school, either private preschool or whatever. They were all literal geniuses, and the guys were like, dude, this is fucking amazing. we got to follow these kids. Mm-hmm. Well, they followed them, and like three years later in third grade, they gave them uh, an updated test for their age level. Uh, a huge percentage drop-off, like something around the 50% mark, were no longer in genius category. So they And where did this drop off? Yeah, happen? what were they attributing that to? Well, we're getting there. So they started public school, and then they followed them into sixth grade in high school, and eventually college, and they gave them tests all throughout the way, and each time they gave them a test, more and more of these kids were dropping out of the genius range until you're in college, and a very tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of the children that were now in public school retained the genius category, like .0 something percent. Pretty much proving that you put your kids in school, they become beat the fuck down. Like they lose their creativity, they they're all all of a sudden they're part of the system, yeah, mm-hmm. and they have they're basically indoctrinated into what you me you know we all experience where you got, you know, twenty thirty forty kids in a classroom sit down shut the fuck up do your homework you don't talk until you're told to talk you raise your hand like nothing creative like you're just you're beat everything's beat out of you, and this this test was so mind boggling that the scientists are like well let's do it again let's do it somewhere else and the same results happened a second time so they like they proved it they're like dude this is insane. So what I'm getting at is that, you know, that is the beginning of our self-limiting beliefs. When somebody goes, you know, oh, Howard's like, dude, I want to be, or Brandon, I want to be a firefighter. Mm. Hey, look at you, you're a fucking amazing firefighter. You go save kittens and shit. <laughs> <laughs> True. I okay. He literally fights fires. Like he throws like jabs at <laughs> flames. <laughs> his, but, his method is weird, but it works. Yeah, it but works. somewhere Sorry. along yeah. the line, yeah. there's a kid that wanted to be a firefighter and some other dickhead bully kid not that i'm against bullying and we'll get there in a minute yeah. but they're just like yeah well you're too dumb to be a firefighter mm-hmm. or you're not big enough or you'll never be one and boom psh, right. instant self-limiting belief well, that, i mean that ties into almost any any goal or aspiration that anyone has especially at a young age even i mean even middle age but saying you want to do something and there's always going to be those naysayers there's always going to be those people who are saying it cannot be done it will not be done you are not allowed to have this you don't deserve this and kind of like we're talking about how do you shatter that? How do you shatter that glass ceiling? How do you shatter those, you know, self-limiting beliefs? Yeah. How do you get there? Well, I, I think it's important. Sorry, guys. I'm chewing on the ice from the Johnny Walker. Mm-hmm. It's really yummy. I think it's important that we establish what these things are. And mm-hmm. it's not, it doesn't happen when we're a kid. All of it doesn't happen when we're kids. But we start believing that we're not capable of doing certain things. Or people will gain massive amounts of weight. And mm-hmm. they're told things like, you know, you're a fat fuck. Like mm-hmm. Elizabeth Ashley. She was on the other night with us, with Priscilla and I. And she was verbally abused. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Howie was there. That's right. Howie was with us, too. And, like, literally her, her ex-husband or what? I think she was married, right? It was her. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. I don't know if boyfriend Let's or just, uh, you know, for the lack of better, you know, baby daddies. 
Yeah, so just say baby uh, daddies. You know, you're fat fuck. Uh, just like everything, you know, all these verbally abusive names and it's like, dude, you hear that shit enough? You're self You're gonna start to believe it. Exactly, Yeah. exactly. Absolutely. And so we suddenly stop believing in ourselves. We don't believe that we're limitless anymore. We start thinking, oh, I can't do that or this is the way it should be or we put ourselves in this box and here, here's the one that blows my mind. The the box of the nine to five corporate job that everybody's mm-hmm. in and it's like we're told go to school get good grades go to college graduate college get a job work till you're 60 retire then live off your retirement mm-hmm. and don't fuck up along the way or you'll be homeless <clears throat> and you won't have anything don't fuck your marriage up don't like just, i'm not saying go fuck your marriage up you know? <laughs> <laughs> but what i'm saying is like there's this box that we're put in so we're like oh yeah sure i gotta do that you know that that's what i gotta do and i shouldn't do anything else and that's not for me. And they, you know, suddenly that dream of being an astronaut is gone. They're like, oh, look, there's the shuttle launch, but I ain't going to be on that because I'm too old or, mm-hmm. you know, whatever examples that you guys can think of. So that's that's another one. I mean, but more along the lines that even pushing that, it's like because I've always been the optimistic person that looks at all sides of things. And sure, like that's something that's beaten down into people's heads. But I think it's because people take things too literal in the sense that, like, that's what I have to do, whereas the way I take something like that is that's kind of like the medium. That's like that. If you just want to live that American dream, if you would, and just live a mediocre or decent, be above, keep your head above water. That's what you would have to do to be okay. Yeah. Now that doesn't mean you have to do that by any means, because there's people chasing, building their own companies, living a lot better lives than that, more luxurious life than that, uh, like, you know, different time schedules. But I think what, you know, what people need to understand is that and where they do get stuck is that's not what the life means. And that's not the what you have to get stuck in. It's like if you don't know where you're going, that's kind of like the standard. That's like the basic like the you can't go wrong. If you do that, you're going to live an average life yeah. okay and, you, and you're not saying you have so to do that good. right and that's not saying that you have to do that but by any means that should be the the I, I would say at least the standard you know like what you should aim for because any lower than that i mean you're probably you're doing something wrong you you took a wrong path you're beating yourself up you're doing better than that you're you're building your own company and i think that you know i always push people to live obviously better than that yeah mm-hmm. but you know again i i, I take it as like that nine to five is just kind of like you can't go wrong. You'll be able to have a decent life if you if you follow that route. Sure, and, and like I said, there's nothing wrong with that. But it's it, it, when it boils down to you know people have these dreams and aspirations. They're like, man, I, I really wish I could do this. I mean, you, you pick anybody off the street, and you know if they're not driving a Lamborghini and living the high life or something like that, they're going to be like, man, you know, yeah, I would like to have more money. Or how many people buy lotto tickets on a weekly basis? Mm-hmm. You know. Because they have these self-limiting beliefs that they're not capable of being a millionaire, a billionaire. And I'm, I don't want people to think that that's what this entire podcast is about, is being financially wealthy. And that's the answer to everything. Because it's not. I'm just saying that people that are typically, how can I say this properly? People that have seen good financial success that what aren't trust fund babies and didn't win the lottery, mm-hmm. they work for that shit. Right. And they found a way to do it. And so the first thing that we need to do is look at your self-limiting beliefs and ask yourself, what are those? What do you tell yourself on a daily basis mm-hmm. where you're like, you know, I want to I want to do this. I want to travel, but I can't because, you know, I'm I've always been this way. I'm going to be this way, you know, all my life. Like Brandon, Brandon's just a fuck face and he's been that way since he was a kid. He's still that way now. And he's always going to be a fuck face. <laughs> wow. That's a real dick thing. Yeah, to say. that was. I mean, <laughs> So, <clears throat> fuck you, Gabe. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hence the hashtag. Yeah, I mean, right. Gabe looked fuck at me right. like they're like I was supposed to roll off them. No, like, I, I, I didn't. So, I, so I, I didn't see what's happening. Like, we're we're going to circle, circle back. Gonna we're we're going to circle back no, here for I can a second. See it right, I could see it in their eyes. They're quietly I'm trying plotting. to bruise something, dude. But that was like, dude, that was really deep. That, that was a low jab. They're plotting. I can see it. All right, we're going to circle back real quick. So, okay. So, shattering. Let's give you. Let's give you an example. I'll give you myself an example for a self limiting belief. For those of you that don't know, I'm adopted. Uh, came from a very uh, harsh childhood, and how do you, <clears throat> how do you come, how do you overcome that? How do you get past those hurdles of of being emotionally abused, being um, physically abused? How do you overcome those obstacles uh, mentally? Because uh, mentally and emotionally, because those are some of the biggest battles that we all deal with—not just the financial issues, but the mental and emotional aspect of those things that are kind of like the building blocks of these self-limiting well, beliefs. I, I know where you're going. Let me ask you a question. How open do you, are you to talking about your situation? Totally, yeah. I think it'd be really beneficial. Like, we're talking about relatability, and you've been through some shit, bro. Hmm. Like, we, we, we opening up today? I think, 
I think we let might me, have to hold get on. a crowbar. Yeah, hold on. Let me, have let me, some let more let me, let me take the a black label. Just give me the bottle. You want to get deep on this, dude? We can share some shit. Do I have to pull my pants down deep? Wow. Okay. Well, that wouldn't be that deep. All right. So where where do you want to go with this game? Well, I I very much remember you telling me stories of what your childhood was like and how you watched certain things happen with your mom. Right. Okay. So, all right. I'll start from the beginning. Uh, yeah. My mom uh, had me when she was 16 years old. I uh, never met my father. He was in a gang. He was shot and killed. Um, my mom couldn't take care of me. She had to work on the street. Uh, when she couldn't make ends meet, we were homeless. And then she would have random boyfriends that she would have. And they would throw things at me. They would hit me. She would rub soap in my eyes if I didn't, you know, follow what she wanted. How, how she, old were you when this was happening? I was two, three, four, and five. Good God. So it just, you know, it's, it's, you know, some of you who are listening are probably like, oh my God, it's so sad, you know, but I don't, I don't look at it like that and we'll get to that later. I just want people but, to understand what kind of life you come from. Right. And I come, and I come from, you know, I come from life. like sipping, having neighbors who would give me chocolate milk cartons while I was sitting on garbage cans while waiting for my mom to come back. You know what I mean? Like come back from what? Come back from doing whatever she needed to do to make money. That kind of stuff. Oh. Um, <clears throat> so you then, just hang out on a garbage can and your neighbor's like, here kid, have chocolate milk. Yeah. Yeah, Poor I clearly kid. remember that. Yeah, oh, and, and then some people are like, "Well, how do you remember that when you're that young?" Well, there are certain things. There, I mean, if you out. want to really get to like the you know the psychological factors of it, you the more traumatic the incident, the more that it is ingrained in your hippocampus. Oh, so it's just like the hippo hippo pot, what hippopotamus? Yeah, hippocampus. <laughs> oh hippocampus. my god, that's a big word, bro. Yeah, your boy majored in psychology. Oh, so. what? <laughs> Where is this coming from? He's a thinker. <laughs> uh, were you a reader? <laughs> Anyway, so You're a reader. <clears throat> when I was uh, when I was four, uh, I remember clearly I woke up one night and uh, my mom wasn't there and I started crying, obviously, because, you know, even though that stuff happens to you, it's your mom. Like you still like you, you want them to be there. So you were all alone by yourself. I was all alone. I ran. It was the middle of the night and I run to the door crying and a police officer and a firefighter were at the door. And I'll never forget this. And the, actually, the firefighter picked me up. And that is the whole reason why I wanted to become a firefighter was because I wanted to pay that back. The firefighter picked you up, picked me up and Come rescued on, me. And then they put me into a cop car. And then wow. from there I was put to the Valley of the Moon children's home in Sonoma County. And so then I spent a few months there. got chicken pox, all that stuff. All and the then, good stuff. <clears throat> yeah, it was totally fine. Sweet. And then from there I was moved into, into the foster herp- care system. That's where your herpes came from too. Yes, absolutely. Fuck yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> well, and actually the, wear a condom if you're going to do that because uh, you don't want to spread. I am. <laughs> <laughs> sips black label furiously. Yeah, sips furiously. Anyway, uh, and then from there I was <laughs> <laughs> from there I was moved into the foster care system, and then, you know, is it, you you end up um, inadvertently getting that belief that you're not worth anything. You end up getting that belief that you are not worthy of anything because you keep getting bounced around. No one wants you, et cetera, right. et cetera. And you're not old enough to discern the difference of actually what's going on. Um, so then I was finally adopted when I was six years old by a loving family and they helped raise me and all those things. And that, I was like, that's I, your parents now, right? Very, yeah. Uh, yeah okay. Parents now. Wonderful great, people. Great people. Yeah. yeah. And they gave me that second chance. And that's part of why I was able to overcome those self-limiting beliefs that I wasn't worth anything because I was actually given that second chance at life. You know what I mean? Why, why you have two options when you are put in that position of when you come up against that, that rock in a hard place, you can either decide to become the victim and be resentful and depressed and, you know, say that the world owes you. Yeah. Or you can decide that this is a new chance and you're going to make something of yourself. So you realize that you're not blaming no one. No, I'm not going to blame it. I don't blame my mom. I don't blame my dad. I don't blame any. I don't blame any of what happened. I'm you, actually very you took thankful. control of your life. Yeah. I didn't know that's what it was at the time. But yeah, you took you take control of your life. And that's kind of like we're talking about self limiting, self limiting beliefs. You need to take control of what that self doubt is you need to like gabe said identify what it is at first and then you also need to come up with a game plan of how are you going to overcome that what can you do to overcome those self-limiting beliefs and if some of you are like going to scratch your head and it's not it's not going to be an easy answer it shouldn't be easy easy to answer because you you allowed not blaming yourself but you kind of allowed yourself to slowly digress into these self-limiting beliefs these walls if you will uh that you've put up um, <clears throat> saying that you can only go so far, you can only do so much. Well, well they took time to build up. Now you got to break them down. How are you going to do that? I, well, I'm here to tell you that no matter what anybody says, you can be a gay porn star. Absolutely. So you can check out my tape next month. And <laughs> <laughs> really? I'm so, I'm well, so we are not. We are non-binary. I don't, I don't get the VIP. How, you don't remember that? We're, We're not filming it together, bro. Sorry. Sorry, sorry. That was the yeah, that was so. the uh, the hook. K-fed, I got you. K-fed. Yeah. So, <laughs> Howie, we're we're opening up, man. Over to you. 
you really want to walk down that road. I think we should. I mean, I'll this, your, I'll I, hold I, your this, hand, bro. Okay, this I'll is one of those. Hand. This is one of those nights, and we're just like, hey, let's get some bullet points. We'll just, well, let's, uh, uh, hold, let's walk down. People have been telling us they like to hear about our past, and we're being very real about who we are. Well, so I can just tell you, this isn't no yellow brick road. This is more like the white road of meth. So <laughs> that's fine. Bring it on. Um, I want to hear. Um, it. No. So I mean, I want to hear how your self-limiting beliefs were created. Okay, for sure, definitely, and I think that my story. You know, really defines and by any means. Uh, you know, I am not like I don't consider myself like the saint, by uh, you know, or anything like that because I still have you know my doubtful moments and some things that really shine. But you know, if we're breaking those limitations, those stereotypes or whatnot, uh, I was born into you know um, a family. I was a uh, the second so i have a sister uh older sister 13 years older uh the reason 13 years older is because i wasn't planned uh my mom used uh you know my mom calls me her baby tumor and for the longest time uh, I, what i never knew why she called me. it was always this cute thing of calling me well you know when i was old enough to understand she would tell me well i called you my baby tumor because when she was when she was pregnant with me she thought that she had a tumor she didn't know she was pregnant oh and, uh, you know, until she was a couple months pregnant, she goes in and, you know, the doctor's like, uh, Mrs. Perry, you're not, you know, you don't have a tumor, you're pregnant. And, uh, you know, my mom always jokes about it now, knowing that obviously for the most part I have my sanity, but she's like, well, <laughs> if I would have known that I probably wouldn't have been doing all the drugs that I was doing. Oh, you know? man. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I always joke back with that. Obviously being older is like, you know, well, it's probably because I had a placenta of a God. I don't know. Like, <laughs> uh, something, something to protect me. Well, I don't know because my mom, you know, belief. she was like, I'm like, because to this day, I don't think she's, <laughs> I, to this day, I don't think she's really like fully admitted to the thing. She, I was like, well, like, what were you taking? I'm assuming meth thin she was an alcoholic right. so she was drinking all the things that really should have made me a crack baby pretty pretty much um but no growing up so i grew up in a uh, if you would party drug family uh both parents were addicted to meth sister was also addicted to meth wow. um sister had her first child when i was four so we're four years apart and then my sister ended up having three kids all from different fathers she never stayed with them so they all had different fathers so we were in this kind of like party whatnot uh it was always ongoing like that. Um, and some of the things that I remember like growing up, especially with all these, my, you know, my little siblings and everything was that my family was never around. So like your, your, your standard your family where like, you know, you have rules, curfews and whatnot. I never really had any of that because my family was always worried about the next dope run or whatnot. Right. And, Jeez. you know, growing up, you know, I look back on it and I see a lot of kids in the same place that I was and they end up following under that. They become little reckless children. They don't, they don't do well in school. They get into drugs early, but me growing, there was just something, I don't know. Internally, I knew that I was always a good math student. Uh, I didn't follow my sister's steps getting in trouble all the time. I was, I was, I was always doing my homework. I was an athlete, always staying on top of sports, but growing up, what people didn't really know was what I had to battle at home. You know, I, I would come to school and uh, in elementary school, I was actually called the B.O. Bomb. And I think we talked about this. The B.O. Yep. Bomb. The body odor bomb. bomb. Right. Yep. And that was because my parents were smokers. Um, they and our household was always just broken down. They didn't really take care of it. You know, we always mm -hmm. had kittens that were shitting all over the house. Oh, right. You know, peeing all over the place. Clothes would sit in front of the washer. They would get peed and you know shit on all the so time. You just, you suck. know, house was always just falling apart. And so I smelled like you know whatever that may be, and and cigarettes all the time. So, wow. you know, it was really always this weird thing where it's like, yeah, I was looked up to at school because I was like an athlete, I was smart, but at the same time, I was just like this bum. And you know, in, in reality, but it was like my my parents kind of really were. We lived in a you know a two bedroom apartment with. My parents, my sister, me, and her, like, you know, up to her three kids that she Whoa. had. Whoa. You know, and for and, the, and you were the fat kid, too, right? And, I, and I, was, I, was, I was fat because, you know, we were eating what? We were eating, like, you know, hamburger helper all the time, chicken nuggets, fish sticks. The, they were like chicken patties. I don't know if you remember, like, yeah, their little thin chicken patties. It was always junk food. You always eat as much as much as you well, can. Well, dude, I remember when you food. and I were in high school together, what you would eat. You, go to, you would either bring, like, some shitty lunch or you would eat the cafeteria food. Yeah, I, I mean, totally it, it was... It was is always that you know and I, I grew up on that eating fast food all the time and like you know I lived the lifestyle like it'd be like my parents would be like oh Howard you know they always send me to Jack in a Box or something and we'd go right down like the street like and to me it was like it was always like cool like you know 
my family wanted something from me. You know, they were like, Howard, like, go, like, go treat, like, here's some money, go down Jack in the Box. So I would always ride my little scooter or something, load up my backpack full of Jack in the Box, bring it home. And it was like such a cool thing. I was like, hey, I'm you bringing- had the responsibility of doing right. that. It was awesome. You know, but and you're um, destroying your. I was destroying, you know, in terms of health and, and whatnot. Um, but some of the, like the, the really strong, memorable things is I remember my parents being affected by the drugs and being under the influence of a lot of things. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I look back on it and my father used to always like bring me with him. Like, he was a tow truck driver and yeah. he used to always bring me with him on his, some of his night calls. And in my head, I was like, oh, cool. Dad's bringing me like I get to be part of like go to work with dad kind of thing. Yeah. But really, you know, he would bring it, you know, me to he was an overweight guy addicted to drugs eating fast food all the time really to start hooking up the vehicles and help him on his calls. So believe it or not, by the time I was like 12. I could fully operate a tow truck. Shut up. No joke. I mean, fully hook up a car and whatnot. And that was because... I'm sure it was on school nights, too. Well, because he'd usually be high on on Mm -hmm. drugs or whatnot. And he'd be like, okay, go hook up the truck and whatnot. And he would hook... I would go out, hook up this car, whatnot. And we, we would tow it to where it needed to be. But, you know, the hard part, now I think back on it, was after we did the calls, when we'd stop by random hotel rooms, and I was always told to just sit in the car. You know, and I oh, like, why am I sitting in the car? Right. And he, it, you know, you know, you put one and one together, you know, now, and it's like, well, he was going in because he was getting his drugs and whatnot. And I remember countless times it'd be like 11 o'clock, you know, and keep in mind, I'm like eight years old, nine years old. It's 11 o'clock, you know, at night I got school the next day and I'm like, I'm tired and I don't know what's going on. And I get out of the car or the truck and, you know, I go and knock on the hotel door and like peek it and you'd see like some crackhead lady, like open it, like look at me like what? Like, um, and my dad would be, oh, I'll be out there in a minute. And they would slam the door on me and I'd be mm-hmm. back out in the parking lot at and eight years old, two hours would go by dude. Right. My and daughter's five and a half and I won't let her go down the street. Dude, at five, you're not holding my hand. Dude, at five, no, it's at five, like, you're going into kindergarten. Yeah. I was walking to school on my own whoa, by that time. Whoa. I was staying home. Yeah. All that. Um, so I remember you telling me recently that, um, you know, we were doing something in, I think you were looking in the mirror and you just weren't satisfied with like the way you looked and you're just like, I always see myself as that B.O. bum, even to yeah. this day. And, and, and uh, you know, that goes for a lot of us who have like come over like those humps and everything. You know, my ultimate fear, like for the longest time, I would say up until a couple of years ago, and even it'll still bug me now, is if I go out and like I'm not wearing cologne or I'm not wearing deodorant and I get a whiff or whatnot and you'll see it and, like you smell natural B.O. whatnot, yeah. nothing bad. Like anyone, like uh, if you were to smell, you'd be like, oh, Howard, you just forgot to put deodorant. No big deal, right? Yeah. Well, I smell that in the first, you know, the first reaction is like B.O. bum. Yeah. And I think like I smell, I smell like cigarettes and it automatically like PTSD sucks me right back into that. Like I smell like what are people think? Like people are looking at me. People right. are probably watching me. And, and this is because this went all the way up into high school. I remember my first freshman year girls and whatnot you know and when you get into high school like this is a big deal like you start oh, yeah. you know, puberty and whatnot yep. and i remember girls and you stuff, got a shower like, with the other dudes you know the cute girls the cute <laughs> girls and whatnot you know would be like God, like how you smell like cigarettes like and you smell but i don't know the, the cute girls are always the smokers too they're like no no the, 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 okay no, now, no, no, now no, okay no, we're gonna break this yeah. those girls though would always excuse me because i was also a stoner by a freshman year like okay so like i kind of got into weed like down the road whatnot i didn't get into meth okay guys so lay off <laughs> but God. i started smoking <laughs> weed but i remember all those girls would always say it smelled like that like you know come senior year they're doing the exact exactly. same thing all of a sudden exactly. they're those smoking people like yep. a chimney. but that's also and then it's because cool. they were they were they grew up in this sheltered life yeah, oh, yeah. I be so my entire you know like there was that my second most I'll memorable moment <laughs> the second most memorable moment and um you know this one means a lot to me now because it was a moment with my mom and she's now been clean since oh my god what's I was sophomore, so that's like ten years now. Wow, it's amazing. You know, and uh, we'll get to the reason why she became clean. But the most memorable, we were—I was in sixth grade, and we went on a field trip. And you know, they would always offer like parents to chaperone, right? And they'd always ask me if my parents wanted to chaperone. And here's the thing. I was always so embarrassed for my parents to show up when we did the teacher ter- like the, the teacher parent meetings and yeah. stuff. That was always the most embarrassing moment in my life because my parents were always strung out on drugs. They were always high on drugs. And here I am looking like homeless and like they would be like, oh, Howard's doing really well. And you would get a, a you would get a teacher that's like Howard's doing really, really well. And you would get they would see this strung out parent and you can see in the teeth like am I like I'm watching the teacher and you can see that the teacher is like hurt like this sucks for this child. They could just. They fully understand. They understand, the and it's like, like you know, you have you got, so much potential, but right? 
this is what you're or doing. like it, you know the rare case of oh howard's not doing so well it'd be the oh well I'll, I'll make sure he does well and like in the teacher's eyes are probably like are you gonna beat this kid yeah and you yeah. know and the thing was i was never like you know i grew up with a mom that was like oh you want to cry well i'll give you a reason to cry kind of mentality oh man oh, my, my well you know my dad used to say that to me but it was did he did he actually beat you nah never <laughs> <laughs> now i wasn't beat but I, i'd be slapped or punched in the face like, oh shit bro um but again with that being said that was not a, like a regular thing like i have to say i was a mama's boy and i watched my sister take a brunt of that and most of the alcoholism and i watched my sister get beat by my mom a lot so I, I learned to kiss ass really well and blame things on my sister so so you had all these self-limiting beliefs that were just it they just happened because of your situation i guess in any in any case the limit the limitation game like yeah. would be like okay you should be into drugs like you should be following your sister's footsteps and your parents footsteps you this shouldn't have any motivation Yep. You should be beat down. You should be a fucking bo bum. You should be a drug addict. You should be all this. But I, I wasn't. I would separate myself. The friends I had were always wealthy friends. I had a lot of great friends, and I would say say wealthy, but parents with well off. And I'd always stay with them. They would always take care of me. And I always placed myself in environments like that. So I always separated myself. Taking that brunt though, and even those people that like I was close to would still call me the bo bum, yep. but whatnot. I would always place myself. So I. You know, I broke that. Like that wasn't gonna define me. So how did you break the self-limiting belief that you were always the fat kid? You know, when you, I know when you came to us, you were pretty heavy, bro. I was pretty heavy. I and mean, you, ha I, you know, what, what was it? Dude? How did you shatter yourself? Well, that was that conversation that Howie and I had when I had just finished my first workout with you. When I first came home from from the Marines, remember in, that in your red sweats? Yeah, in my red sweats, <laughs> I would wear those every single day. Okay, yeah. well, so, here's here's where that moment, and we'll fast forward, you know, because uh, and we're gonna just kind of touch base. So one of the big defining moments my, when my mom became sober, she became sober because she was arrested at Kaiser. She went for some medications, high on drugs, right. off duty cops saw her, and it was basically like, "Who is this lady?" It's like foggy as shit outside, wearing these purple like Elton John glasses, <laughs> stunner shades, right, out, right. right. So, uh, you know, that happens. Um, so how it all really changed is because throughout high school, I was, be I was bettering myself. You know, I started smoking weed when I was in middle school, in the junior high, whatnot. But then I started picking up sports again. I started playing football. I, I was a great athlete. I've always been a great athlete, but I was always stockier. I'd never beat that. Like, I was always still, like, always worried about my body, worried about my body fat. Like, pool parties and stuff happened. I didn't want to take my shirt off. Didn't want to be that kid, you know? Yeah. Then, uh, you know... After post high school around 21, um, this is where I kind of started hitting a low point and I started experimenting with drugs, mm -hmm. you know. And again, I will, I've never done meth, I know, of. <laughs> um, so <laughs> I will I not go that remember. route. But I started doing like, you know, I, I tried acid once, uh, coke, uh, blow. weed, yeah, so or blow, coke, blow, you know, it's that. all the same thing, you know. I started doing that, and you know, one day, you know, I, I sat there and looked at myself, I'm like. This is th this is what's happening. I'm turning into what everyone thinks that I should be. I'm becoming and, my parents. And I had this argument with someone, and it was an ex actually. And she thought, you know, her words were, "You're going to be just like your parents." Ooh. Ooh. And was that Valerie? No, it was not Valerie. Valerie, no, would never. No, oh. no. <laughs> we, won't, we won't say her name. Uh, for just sake, certain just somebody. That, the certain somebody said that, and uh, Did that just that hit really home? hit yeah. really hard, and. That ended up leading into me binging and some drugs and alcohol, you know, for a couple Oh, that was days. when you disappeared, right? Yeah, I disappeared. That was right before you came. And oh. what happened was. Oh, that's what it was. And what happened was I ended up, uh, you know, I failed like a final that would have got me my associate's degree. I got a promotion, like everything just like, and I almost lost my job in this new promotion. It was just all like, what the fuck is going on? Yeah. And I had like a, like a epiphany or like a. Well, a moment, you know, and, uh, you know, I was like, I need to change. And, um, you know, this was around around the time when like you, when you and, and Brandon, yeah. and when I say you, I mean, Gabe and Brandon and actually the whole crew, there was a lot of guys there. You guys, you guys would have a pack. It was like, know? yeah, it was me, Brandon. It was like the Hewitt's Rob and <laughs> yep. Ty, big yep, Ty, big Ty, small one dude, him, with right. fucking dreadlocks. Oh my Huge God, dude, the guys guy. that, you know, let me sidebar for a minute. So everybody knows who Ty is. Ty is the fucking, he's, he's just so old school power lifter. One day we're sitting there trying to get some tips for him on the bench press. Mm -hmm. And he just loads up 315 on there. He hasn't a single set yet. And so we're, you know, we're, we're doing work sets. 
And Ty's like, okay, look, brother, this is what you got to do. When you come down, you got to lift it off like this, right? And <laughs> yeah. you put it down on your chest. And he just does this long ass pause rep. He was he, with three, like 15, dude. He was sitting there talking for like two minutes. Yeah, he yeah, just sits dude. there and lectures us with 315 on his chest for it, it. I mean, no, no shit. Like in all reality, it probably was 30 seconds. That's a long ass time for a pause rep. Then he goes, okay, and then when you're like this, then you got to push it up and you get right here to the sticky. No band. struggle. No struggle. No struggle. He pushes it about halfway and holds it there and then talks for another 30 seconds. And then like, and then you push to the top. And then keep in mind, this was probably like this, <laughs> this is like, like the fuck did I just see happen? This was yeah. after like several repetitions. Like we were building up to that three fifteen, mm -hmm. and when we yeah. got the three fifteen, he decided to give us this lecture. So like, it wasn't fresh by any means either. Oh, Ty? Yeah. That, oh, I thought that was like the. Oh no, he was working out with us. Yeah. Oh, that's right. <laughs> That was one of the so first. That was some, like the first time right. I ever like got oh, to work out with you guys. I was wearing. I was wearing well, that, that, was because, that, that Green well, Mountain Dew. It, well, like, there's a picture. There's a picture of us. That. I'm wearing the red sweats. We're in uh -huh. the Green Mountain Dew. Gabe has a the the KT stupid tape. ass KT tape. Hey, my bicep was fucked my up, bro. Bicep. Okay, well, I mean, <laughs> anyway, so that was that was the moment, and uh, I mean, really like meeting you guys and like talking to Gabe. I mean, uh, talking to Brandon. And the funny thing is, remember, Brandon, I talked to you. It was at a bar. It I was, was like, at getting a bar. Drunk. We were literally at a bar, and I was like, dude, I just worked out. With this cool ass dude, uh, you know, ex WWE wrestler, blah blah blah, you know. And, and he's like, what? And, no, and tell what? Me. Yeah. Rob was like, Rob, Eddie, they're all in you yeah, with all bouncers the guys. and stuff yeah, like we're that. All the bouncers, oh, La Rosa. Rosa. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, I was like, dude, like, and I'm like hammered at this point, right? And I go up to him, and but even still, be, not hammered, but drunk, I went up to him, and like, I still was like hurt, and I was like, I need to change, and so like, in a drunk super, I was like, dude, like, how could like. How do I get in with you guys? Can I lift with you guys? That'd be so cool. And Bram's like, yeah, tomorrow, be there. Like, well, it was like early morning, dude. Yeah, it was. This was like at like one thirty like in the last morning, call. Dude. This is like right around <laughs> last call, man. I'll tell you what, though. So what I did was I, I set my mind to that. I committed to that. Yeah, like I did. got up early. I fucking hung over, pounded water, showed up. Yep. And you know it was a painful workout, but like and you and I'll never forget the look on your face, man. Like I wish you, I wish who was ever listening to this right now could see the look on his face. It was like the most like paradigm shift and for those of you who don't know what that means it just means like you have this like moment of elation moment of transition and his face went from like depressed kind of hurting to like there's that like light behind his eyes like, and you're like like hope like I, mean, I need to do this yes, again and again and again and again and again i remember and pushing you yeah you PR'd that day bro you yeah. just like no i've never oh, done this dude, I, I, yeah, well, at the time i hit 335 on the bench dude it was like dude you didn't know you were capable of I didn't know, no, because before that, dude, I think 305 once when I was like, and you were I just, don't know, before like, that, you were the BO bum. You know? And that was the day, and remember the first time I worked out with you? I PR'd oh, yeah. with you? Yeah. Going pound for pound with bench press? I oh remember my. That. Yeah, you God. would. Quit. You so, know? What, you know, what we're saying here, guys, is that we're raised with these, these self limiting beliefs. And, uh, you know, I'm trying to be cognizant of time. We're going to go over this time. So be prepared, guys. We're probably going to go over a little over an hour. But, you know, my self limiting beliefs were that I, I was picked on in high school. You, you, many, many of you guys know that I was picked on and I just was like always the nerd, always the geek, always that fucking kid that just couldn't do anything right, the loner, had no friends, I was an introvert. And that was always who I felt like I was. And when I got into uh, my, my later life, even in WWE, I was like quiet, I didn't know who I was. And I think that was part of the reason my career didn't take off like a rocket. Even when I got up on the road and everything, I was still, I remember just like, I'm not the guy that can talk. I, dude, here, here's a great story. So funny that, they when I get my push and a, and a push in wrestling is when they get the machine behind you like all the you know Vince notices like okay let's mm -hmm. put some money behind this guy let's give him his own entrance let's give him some time on TV you got to think about how much TV time costs right right so I came out I was I was a good guy we called them baby faces and they took me off TV they're like look dude you need to be a bad guy because you're just too menacing looking you nobody's know, buying it so I you know trained to be a bad guy trained to be a heel came out for the and first time for people to know a heel is a person that basically, basically loses. Me. Uh, not all the time. Yeah, not all the time, but you know, the job is to like unless you Make got a long look good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, the the idea is the the heel is the bad guy. Your job is to get heat from the crowd and yeah, you do a lot of losing, uh, but that one time you steal it is when the crowd just hates you. They're like, "You just fucking stole that title, motherfucker." And that's what it builds to. It's like you shouldn't have won, you cheated, whatever. Point being, the character that I somehow manifested didn't talk. Like it was not a talker. He was just mean looking. And I was big. I was like 240 back then, maybe 238. You know? Well, you but, can't say oh, that's no big, big because I know you when like you say big. And I know Gabe Tough being big is like 270. Yeah, 265, what, 270. 280. I hit two. I legitimately hit okay, 280. Not for like, not for like half a second. Relax. 
It, you know what? <laughs> that was like, I'm not going to shit I today. Was, I'm going to eat as much food as possible. I for four days on purpose. <laughs> yeah, right. It was painful. I stepped, I hit 280. Yes. So and my character didn't talk. And I remember we're, we're doing a, a, a raw right before bragging rights. So it's like you get smacked on a raw against each other. And we had people from the roster on both sides. I was like one of the main dudes. I'm in this upcoming pay-per-view. And so during the commercial break, what nobody sees, you got three minutes of commercials or two minutes of commercial, whatever, is... Uh, you know, each team is standing on the side. I'm I'm standing across from guys like you know fucking Cena and Orton and fucking you know major players and edges around me and Christian, and they're just passing the microphone. CM Punk's there, they pass the microphone and they're trying to entertain the crowd while they're in commercial. I'm like, oh yeah, hey motherfucker, and they all got something to say. And I just remember going, oh fuck, please don't give me the mic, please don't give me the mic. I don't know what to fucking say. Please, I'm, I'm not. I don't talk. This character doesn't. Have, I, please don't. Please, I don't want to fucking talk. Please. Yeah. And I'm like, dude, now you give me a fucking microphone, I don't shut up. I know exactly what to say. But back then, that's who I was in high school. I reverted to my self-limiting belief that I I wasn't a talker. I was quiet. I was shy. And it, it I, I'm i certain that that fucked me. Because had I figured out how to talk as that character, I would have gone places. But yeah. that character had no personality. It was just big, mean. Nobody could relate to that, that character. There was nothing beyond just a big, mean face. And I threw people around. Yeah. So that's why that character never worked, in my opinion. And that was kind of the downfall of the menacing Tyler Rex character. Mm-hmm. So that being said, we all have these self-limiting beliefs. And another one that I have, and I know a lot of people probably struggle with this, is finances. You know, all My life, my parents had a certain amount of money. And they, were, they were okay. We were like middle class. Uh, but you know, I wore shoes from Kmart. You know, I, I suffer the, oh, uh, you get your fucking shoes at Kmart, get your shorts from Kmart. I, I went through all that shit, you know, because my parents couldn't mm-hmm. afford, you know. I remember my very first brand name shoes. They were the British Knights. And you guys probably don't even know what the fuck those dude, are. You make me feel like an asshole, dude. Yeah, because we were, we were, bro? not we were like, not middle class. We were poor class. And like, I was complaining about having to wear Kmart stuff. Well, you, wow. Well, I, that's, that's where I was at. Well, I, I mean, wore, my parents. I wore JC Penny, so. Yeah, I was Mervyn's. <laughs> I wore a Payless. Oh, you remember, um, yeah, Mervyn's. Mervyn's, California. Mervyn's was it, bro. Yeah, Mervyn's yeah, was yeah. the spot. Like, yep. uh, you know, I bought all my shit there, bought all my jeans there. Fuck Walmart. If I, yeah, Walmart wasn't around, dude. If I had a pair of Levi's, holy shit, my life was good, dude. Yeah. Like, 501s were it. But <laughs> I remember this, this belief when I graduated from college that when I had money, I had an apartment, and then I got my condo and stuff. I'm like, okay, this is. This is it. This is what I'm making. And, uh, dude, I'd see people on TV, and I'm like, I want that lifestyle. I'm like, I, mm, I just got to keep working, and maybe, I guess that's not for me. And then, you know, I get to WWE, and I'm like, I make a certain amount of money, and I see the top guys. I'm like, I guess that's not for me. You know, I just, I got to be comfortable. As long as I'm comfortable, I'm okay. And I remember that's how I was raised. As long as I'm comfortable, I'm okay. As long as I pay my bills, I'm okay. That's what, that's what life's about. And I got to start a fucking retirement account. Oh, yeah, I, I need to do that someday. And I never got around to doing that. And then I leave WWE, and I'm poor as fuck like I sacrificed that to be with my family because I was traveling so much and poor as fuck trying to do this digital marketing business and my standard was that as long as I made enough money to pay the bills we were doing okay so we'd have just enough clients to pay the bills every month and I'd shit my pants every month when it came out to you know time to run run payroll <clears throat> and somehow we made it like every I mean we scratched by like just barely scratched by and we're renting renting the house and we're trying to pay all the bills and and you get comfortable being in that uncomfortable position you yes. tell you tell yourself that it's okay but yes. you know in the back of your mind that you deserve more you know in the, and yes. that kind of segues into our second point of know your value yes even though you're stressing out and you hate yourself and like you just you're like what am I doing that other part of you is like, yeah, it's okay. It's going to be okay. Like I'm doing okay. Cause I made it right now. But you have the other party that's just fighting and clawing saying, no, this is not okay. This is not what I deserve. <laughs> but dude, I couldn't have said it any better. Like, and like you said, number two, know your value that all comes into play. And I, I want to kind of segue into like when body started starting, I, I knew I was so confident with like what we were doing. I knew we had value. I knew what we were offering, even though we were we were taping shit on iPhones and I was clipping together. <laughs> yeah. I pirated a copy of Adobe Premiere off uh, uTorrent to get started. Mm-hmm. I was determined, and I taught myself how to do this shit. We were just slicing the shit together. I was pirating music, like you, I mean, you name it. I was doing. I was like, whatever it yeah. fucking takes. Yeah, dude. yeah, I remember that. But like, I knew we had value, and I just kept thinking, you know, someday I'm gonna I'm gonna buy music. I'm gonna pay these guys back, which I actually have done. Just if you like all our copyrighted shit, I went back and I bought all the licensed music now, so we've like paid all the artists back. It's actually kind of that's cool. cool. But the point being is like we I, I knew our value. I knew we had something good to offer when people started saying, hey, this is pretty cool shit, man. I like what you guys are doing. You're real. I was like, oh, we're on to something. And then that segued into when we actually started being a, a productive company and we weren't in the negative. 
we actually started making a profit because we work so fucking hard at this. Like Howard and Brandon are always there. They're always working out with us. They're always taking videos. They're always holding the camera. Like we were the original camera crew. Well, remember not only that, like we remember when a good day for us was when we sold like a hoodie, <laughs> yeah. a ebook. You Dude, know what I mean? Remember, remember, yes. yeah, remember when we were e-book. really excited, like when we switched, uh, we switched companies and we got shipped all those hoodies and we were so ecstatic to pump. We were like, Dude, 50 hoodies, we got a package, or like 100 hoodies, we like, this blew awesome. our mind, yeah, and we're, we're like, like sitting no there packaging 100 like, hoodies. made it, you know what we're I mean? We're like, dude, like, this is so awesome, this you, many okay, people. I don't think and we've told that story. So for those of you that don't know, we would actually hand package our own, we were our own production factory, like we would get all the products shipped to us, yeah, separate get, from the plastic the bags, bags we, separate we from the shipping label, separate from the product, and we would literally be sitting up till like midnight, Ooh, yeah, late. Pack, later than that, packaging our, Dude, packaging yeah. our hoodies Putting them together. Putting them in manila envelopes, yeah. like the, the brown Matching envelopes. the labels to the addresses, We'd and, and hand packaging the, the sizes together, and we putting them in. We hand wrote thank you notes. Hand wrote thank you notes. Oh my God, and that, that led into that thing that was around like Christmas, and we're like, dude, what if we had Added, like the personal like you know the personal and, and we started like we, we would pick yeah. a random person here or there and we do like that little video remember it took like a hundred takes on me now, it's still on we YouTube. were basically still on YouTube. oh yeah and we did that like christmas take for that person oh we yeah we did like 10 still of those there. where we yeah, did personal great. videos for customers yeah it was, had, it was like he, uh, us three priscilla safira aaron and john and we just like hey we just want to say thanks for everything you guys did and Gabe? we yeah what what we need to do that yeah, we do. <laughs> I'm like, what did I do? We need to set some time really aside. Intense, yeah. I hope everyone's listening because this needs to be a thing, <laughs> and that way it's documented. We need to set a like side some time to just like randomly throw out a thank you to people because I'm, I'm okay you know that. they're I'm the reason okay we are able to do what we do. I'm, yeah. I'm totally okay with that. But but I don't want to segue too quick into the next one. I, I, I gotta say this. I, you know, we went from packing these hoodies and like my my floor to be lined in them. <clears throat> and your whole entire living room would yeah. be just taken over. Well, and just so you guys know, the very first year Body Spartan was in business, our net profit for the entire year was six thousand dollars, and it all went back into fucking inventory the next day. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> January one, we bought six thousand dollars in inventory, um, but that was you know three hundred sixty five days of doing fucking packing hoodies and doing that shit. And in my head, I'm like, you know, this is all I'm ever gonna have. I'm comfortable, and maybe this will take off someday. And so. When we repackaged Body Spartan as a program and we started to actually sell stuff, I remember seeing the revenue start to come in. And I remember going, holy crap, we made, we made 100 bucks today. I'm like, this is, whoa. I'm like, that's good. Uh, that's, uh, you, know, you know, cool. You know, whatever. We'll just, we'll reinvest it. And then the next, you know, it, it started to, we started to see some more zeros. And I remember we got to like 1000 bucks in the PayPal account. Mm-hmm. And I'm just going, oh, shit, that's almost... It's almost rent for a month. I'm, I'm like halfway there. I'm like, this is, that's something, dude. I'm like, oh my gosh, we're, we're doing it. And then we got to 5,000. I'm like, okay, cool. And we hit, and this was a big one for me, guys. And for the longest time, like I just couldn't visualize seeing $10,000 in the PayPal account because money kept going out to buy inventory. And in my head, I'm just like, you know, I'm not the kind of guy that has $10,000 in liquid revenue, you know, funds sitting around in an account somewhere. I'm just not that guy. And Priscilla mm-hmm. pulls me aside one day and she's like, you have to visualize you have to see what you want. You have to actually, your, your self-limiting belief, Gabe, is that you're, you're not meant to have money. Like, that's your self-limiting belief. I'm like, no, I, I feel like I could. She's like, can you see the account with 10,000 bucks? I'm like, mm. I'm like, and I closed my eyes. I tried to do it, and I couldn't. I would see like, you know, 6,500 or seven, and I'm like, okay. And I took myself through the process one night, and I remember going, okay, seven. And I, I, I went through the visualization of eight, of nine, and then of, and I, I saw the, the $10,000. And then you worked at knowing your value. Exactly. And you realized it. Yeah, and I, kn- I knew that we could get there, and, and it, it happened. And then other things happened with more, more zeros, and it just, I had to see those numbers. And so that was my self-limiting belief. And so Brian is talking about now, so guys, the idea that is know, know your self-limiting beliefs. Know exactly what they are and fucking shatter them. Get over it. Visualize yourself with who you want to be, where you want to be what it is you want to do and don't let anything fucking hold you back because somebody says that you have to be a certain person that you're a bo bum or you know you were born this way in this family and your mom you know literally just fucking set you on a garbage can to do what she had to do you're never gonna fucking amount to anything kid and you're gonna be in the system your whole life well fuck that shit dude you can be whatever the fuck you want you just have to see it in your head and you have to get over that self-limiting belief and you have to see it and recognize and go, holy shit, this is the cycle. Like you said earlier, this is the cycle that I'm in and I have to break that cycle. So that is shattering self-limiting beliefs. 
Right. So, I mean, we're just going to transition right in the third, but I want to, again, recap, like you said. So, like, the first one is you need to, to acknowledge, you know, these limiting factors, the, this life that you should or ideally in the world should have had or whatnot. But really, you know, number two, your value. So, you shatter those limiting beliefs, right? And here's the third one, which we're going to segue into. It's really... Who you want to be is on the other side. Isn't this the phrase or the, what we use is on the other side of the door, right? Oh, yeah, exactly. And here's the thing, guys, for everyone, and I mean everyone, no door is ever shut on anyone. That door is always cracked open. And all it needs is to be pushed open. So here's the thing. Once you realize your value and you know that you're separating yourself from that limiting factor, all you got to do is fucking Sparta kick that door <laughs> open. Sparta <laughs> kick that shit. You know? And just fucking open up because the person you want to be is on the other side of the fucking door. And it's already cracked open. All you got to do is push it open. But what stops people from doing that? I, uh, I that think it's be, fear. Be, that would be fear. It's totally fear. fear. Uncertainty. Depression. Which, worry that worry. Or just like you, I think the biggest one is fear of the unknown. What scares people that like what scares people the most is the unknown. Yeah, what, the what ifs, the what could happen, the what, out of their know. comfort zone. Absolutely, but like I've been People, doing this. This is my I'm yeah, paying absolutely. my bills. I got my car payment you covered. Man, you will never ever succeed what you want to the way that you want to if you don't step outside your comfort zone. That is a pure fact. That's an uncomfortable fact, but it's a fact. It's, you will yeah. never succeed the way that you want to in the way that you want to if you never step outside of your comfort zone. So do and the fear of stepping outside that comfort zone, you're going to fail, which is also, and we're going to talk about three and four together, is number point number four. Don't be afraid to fail because that is the number one huge driver is yeah. because people don't step outside of that comfort zone. They don't step out that safety net because if I fail, I lost everything yeah. and even though even though i'm hurting right now even though things suck right now i'm managing it because it's comfortable so i'm going to stay here in this little spot no that's bullshit and yeah or if i do this i'm gonna i'm not gonna pay my car payment or i will have these credit yeah. card bills well guess what guys i fucking filed for bankruptcy yeah. i was i was like i decided and, and this is so how my ww career got started i left everything man like i had a i had a medical bill go south at, that i tried to fight and i had great credit so did priscilla and i and we didn't know it got sent to collections because it was supposed to be covered by an insurance uh, company. And we went to refinance our condo. Well, guess what? We had a five-year uh, interest-only loan back when the housing market was great. Well, it was we were paying like 1600 bucks a month or something. It adjusted to like $2,800 a month. And I'm like, I got to leave for Florida. And they're paying me $750 a week to train there. I'm like, how the fuck am I going to pay this? Mm -hmm. So the credit card companies are calling me. The bill collectors are calling me. And one day I'm like, what happens if I just don't pay? Nothing. I can't go to jail. Yeah. They're going to wreck my credit. So what? I failed. I fucking failed. I fell on my face when it came to my old investments, my house, yeah. my fucking loans. I fell flat on my face. And I'm like, okay, well, now what? Okay, I fucking rebuild. And that was when I looked at my WWE career and I'm like, I got to fucking smash this. I can't sit in training. I got to fucking, I, I went to every night class. I went to two practices a day. I, <laughs> I went early so I could talk to the coaches. Like yeah. I did everything I could possibly do. I'm like, I'm not going to fucking let this ruin me. So that being said, like, you know, don't be afraid to fail and it, like it, you can't let it stop you from opening the door and kicking that door down and taking action. People are so afraid to take that first step. I've seen people with great ideas talk about it and talk about it and talk about it. And Howie, what do you always say? Don't. Hey, don't talk about it. Be about it. Exactly. Absolutely. Exactly. People just talk about all these fantastic ideas that they want to do. Like, oh, I want to do this. And, you know, someday I'm going to do this. Well, someday will always be someday until you decide to take action, until you, you decide to kick that door that's down. It's so funny that you say that because and some people are like, well, how am I going to how am I going to do this because um, it's going to take too long to get this done and I don't have the time. Well, you know what? The fucking time is going to pass anyway. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you could still do it. In that time that he said it would take too much time, you could still be actively taking small steps to make sure that what you want to have happen is going to happen. Let's be Because okay. the majority of those people and we're going to just use a real small example. Majority of the people, I want to get in shape, right? I want to go from Billy Fat Pants to fucking Jimmy <laughs> Shredded Pants, all right? <laughs> fucking analogy. Hell yeah. All right? Hell right? Yeah. That's the thing. Well, that, that is not the number one thing. Yeah. People are like, how do I get this 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 keg into a six-pack? I smell it right. Right? Well, the truth, the, mat, the, the, the fact of the matter, the truth is... Like, and I did a real, I crashed course. And like, you guys know how hardcore I was and yeah. how strict I was. It still took me 
12 weeks. Oh, yeah, before your first yeah. competition? Yeah. Yeah, when you were so, when you were Billy so three, kid. Uh, so three months, you know, but, like, I'm not even kidding. I did some shit. Like, I was so hardcore. I, I lost friends. I lost, like, you know, like, like my relationship with the shit. Like, everything was just horrible, dude, because, like, I was literally, like, this is going to happen. There was no other choice. Yeah. So what I'm saying is, like, that should always be an option, but it takes fucking Time. It takes and time. And it's going to take sacrifice. And it takes sacrifice. But a lot of the times, what happens is a person's like, oh, it's going to take me a year to get that physique I want. No, that's that's too much time. A year goes by. Guess what? That person is still hoping for that physique. It's like, do you know if you would have committed one year from today, you would not be complaining about it four years down the road. Yeah, you would have had it three years you ago. You will never get that year back. That's and again, a year off And it kind of cycles back gone. to some people are just still, they're comfortable being in that, like, I'm okay spot. I'm okay with where I'm at. And not, and it kind of goes into that not everyone has that drive. And that's not like bashing on anyone. Just right. not everyone has that personal drive well, of I, wanting to better I themselves. I think it's built into everybody at some point, but I think somewhere along the line, they forgot that they're capable of Yeah, doing exactly. Because as a kid, you know, you start coloring a, a book and then you get you get tired of your parents like, you need to finish that or you need to finish it. And maybe yeah. not everybody's taught that. I take that back. I could be totally wrong on that. But one thing I do know is that time is always available. Like, Absolutely. Do... Do guys like us, do we have any more time in the day? Because I see this comment all the time. I well, don't have enough time well, to work yeah, out If the I way just that fucking worked out do. for a living, I'm like, yeah. oh, yeah. Well, Brandon, what the fuck do you do? Yeah, right? Like, I'm, I'm gone. I, I, was just, I was just three gone. And a half like, I was gone for fighting 35 fires. days Brand, Brand, fighting a fire. How or many hours a day? No, Brandon's fighting fires, but on, on a little bit more realistic level, Gabe, currently me being a full-time employee for you like you want to know like what it really honestly takes and here's the thing i like try to hold my standard like i'm gonna be the first one to admit and not like not being biased any means like gabe you would literally work i don't understand someone who has the drive you do but at the same time that entrepreneur like mentality and like right. this is my company i need to build but on like my end of things and like and don't get me wrong me slacking still is I'm sitting at the computer all effing day yeah. why because <laughs> you know like sitting there answering comments and answering questions because here's the thing sure like if I went and just liked and whatnot and not did anything and sent an oh wow every once in a while that would be it but then we wouldn't be who we are and people know us for actually answering comments in detail and like it takes time and engage like uh. you don't understand like 500 comments and and don't get me wrong 500 comments is like you know, a real slow day, okay? Uh, 500 yeah, comments yeah. alone will take all day to answer. And what's it, my requirement at, for social media? You have to like and comment Like on and comment comment. on all of them. Okay, Even so if there's no comment, now, now, now like take that, that Okay, so like, oh, all you guys do is work out because that's all you see of us. And yeah, that's why yeah. we try to show you, you a little bit on the Snapchat. You see the tip of the iceberg. You, you see the fun. No but here's the thing. Not only are we answering those comments and whatnot, we're editing. There's something that's going wrong with the server. We need to be on that. People oh, buying geez. things on a regular basis. Hey, they're sending, hey, well, this didn't happen. Okay, we need to fix that. Okay, we just filmed a workout. We need to edit this workout. We need to now add the right the right context that we need to oh, add the right. And by the graphics. way, Howard, I don't give a fuck what your plans are tonight. We're podcasting. Oh yeah, right. Okay, <laughs> we're gonna go there. Um, oh, uh, oh, it doesn't matter. Man. It's uh, seven thirty at night. I'm gonna call Howard, and he might have plans with his girlfriend's father to have some whiskey, some chicken, and go over a desk you're building and building some man on man action because you're trying to build that relationship building with your girlfriend. Man on man action. Girlfriend's huh? father, <laughs> and all of a sudden you get approached with Howard. We have a podcast. You know, Brandon goes back to work tomorrow. What? Content needs to happen. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, dude, I'll be there, man. Oh, shit. So, like, dude. you know, it's, like, here's, it's the about well, time. here's the thing. Okay, okay, okay. The misconception is people see us in, it's because they see our videos. They yeah. see us having fun on the Snapchat. But, guys, how, like, okay, take that time, add up all that time of Snapchat. Did you say the Snapchat? Whatever. The Snapchat. The Snapchat. It's like the creatine. Oh, oh the yeah. Creatine. We're gonna, so, take, take, all, take Howard, all our snaps Howard, throughout the day. Howard. Do you have the HIV? <laughs> <laughs> so I see. He was he was tested. He's clean. Oh. <laughs> um, so, uh, so no no take back. take all that time from Snapchat right. Take the you know what you see is a minute and a half to two minutes of a fucking workout video right. Yeah. Which, yeah. which is our, really which long, really which is like is three really hours. Three hours. But yeah. even then, take yeah. three hours. It's okay. Con I condense three hours. A minute and a half to two minutes. Right. Facebook. So take the yeah. three hour video non edited. Then take maybe I don't know. 40 minutes of, of Snapchat, right? Yep. yep. So it's three hours and 40 minutes. And that's what you see out of 24 hours. Not to mention There's 20 how much time hours that you guys do not see. And you're saying that, oh, that's all we do. That other 20 hours is making that three hours and 40 fucking minutes 
possible. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> so true. But even before we got to the point where we're, we're running a legitimate business, when before Body Spark was even a legitimate business, what the fuck were we doing? Brandon, you were a fucking firefighter and personal trainer. How many hours a week did you fucking Holy work? Jesus. Fuck. I was working 60 hours a week. Yeah, exactly, and then coming Howard in and I were at least, at least yeah. working 60 to 70 hours a week, busting our balls daily, hating our lives. And I was running I mean? that Just, digital marketing business that I hated. And like and that was yeah. that was 60 hours a week easily. And so like, where's do I have any more time? So we literally else? we literally went through all four steps. We had the we had the self limiting belief that this is what that's where we were stuck at. Like we couldn't do anything else. Then we had that po- that turning point of where we realized what our true value was. And then we were like took action. We're like, okay, what the fuck are we gonna do? How are we gonna get out of this? We're just gonna fucking we fucking do it. bust we're the door open. We're gonna fucking take action. And we knew that we even though we knew that it was very possible to fail. And how we failed. All of us have failed so oh, many times. Yeah. Are yeah. you kidding me? We've, we've, we've had, made bad we've videos. We've had ideas we've, that have fucking backlash oh on us. God, we've, we've had, had things that haven't ideas. worked we've out. We've had great ideas that Like, failed. we've had, like, events that haven't worked out. Like, we've had so many. And that's just with the body spark inside of it. Like, yeah. in our personal lives, we've had so many things that oh, set us back. Geez. You guys have no idea how much the three of us have had to be each other's rocks through each of our own personal lives of failure, of depression, of just things that have actually, like, truly and hurtfully affected us. And yet, again, coming back to what Howie said... All you guys see is that two minute video of us kicking ass in the gym and you guys throw out that random comment of, oh, if you, you know, if I could do that, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, no, shut well, the fuck what? up. You, you guys have no idea. Can. You the have problem no is idea. that you're afraid to fail or exactly. you're, you're afraid to get started. And that's not or saying you that have you have self-limiting beliefs. Yeah. It's one of these four things that if you can get over this, you've got these keys to success that exactly. we're talking and about. And that's not saying that you have to do what we do. You don't have to do, you know, the workouts like we do if you don't want to. What what we're saying is whatever your goal is, know your ad- value. Yeah, exactly. Know your fucking value, and, and then whatever that. your goal is, whatever your aspiration is, fucking kick the shit out of it. And I, you know what? I know we've gone over all these points, but for know your value, guys, I, we don't spend a whole lot of time of it. I want to touch on it very briefly. I know we're over the hour mark, and I apologize. But for knowing your value, you have to understand that you can sell yourself short, and you can sell yourself cheap, and that will lead back to your self limiting beliefs. You know. We could sell the Body Spartan Genesis program for nine ninety nine, like we originally did, which is a fucking ebook. But guess what? I knew we were worth more than that. I knew that our team was worth more than nine ninety nine for the, and that that program, the nine ninety nine ebook, had the whole concept in it. It had the theory, it had the worksheets, it had everything. But you had to do it all yourself. But we fucking took the extra effort. We took action. We smashed our self limiting beliefs. We took action. We filmed instructional videos. We figured out how to fucking program a website ourselves. We hired people. With our last dollar, when we couldn't figure shit out, whether we were going to fit, we, we, we were like, okay, we're going to do it. If we fail, what, what the fuck? We're back at our regular jobs, right? You're, you're back at Pepsi. I'm back doing digital marketing. You're still fire. Okay, we got nothing to fucking lose. Like, when we're all said and done, six months worth of work and thousands of dollars of our blood, sweat, and tears that we had scraped and saved for into the Genesis program, it's worth. We know what it's worth. It's worth more than we're selling it for. But we want you guys. Like I feel like I feel like the hundred twenty dollar program to be honest with you guys. But we're we're giving it at a value where we feel like people go, yeah, this is. We know our demographic, and we know our demographic is the average person, and the the price point is right. And if people are like, oh, it's like I get that it's too expensive. I'm like, no, I know my value. I know what this company's worth. I know what this program's worth. And here's the other thing: if something's given to you for free. One thing I found is that people do not respect it. Like people are like, oh, just give me the fucking program and I'll do it. Give me the program, give me my supplements. I'm like, you know what? If I did that, you'd fail because I gave it to you. You yeah. didn't earn that shit. Well, yeah. You didn't know your value. Well, not not only our program, even before like I like we all started. And when I remember buying your program for the for, for the first time for nine ninety nine. You know, <laughs> uh, actually, it was nineteen. Then. Oh, that's Ooh. right, because I had gone through and I had done some changes. Yeah, yeah you yeah. did some changes. I knew, my value. I knew my value. So whether it was that program or any other program, you know, when I spent that money, I was like, well, I knew I spent money on this, so I have to do it. That kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas things I got for free, you're like, oh, well, you know what? I got this. It's whatever. Uh, it uh, no big deal. If I don't do it, no loss. Right. Whereas this, like, okay, now you know our program, the worth. All the upgrades we've done to it, yeah, we sell it for you know uh, uh, bucks, scan, sixty bucks, right? Some change on Well, sale. here's the thing, you know, some people say, oh, well, the sixty dollars, that's a lot, you know, I'm not gonna spend that. Okay, well, guess what? You save up, you buy that program for sixty dollars. Three months from now, you tell me if it was worth it and that spent, and I guarantee, if you stick to the fucking program, you're gonna tell me that you would have spent sixty dollars, fucking eight times, yeah. to get the same results. Agreed. And look at our people like. 
Ashley, who lost over 100 pounds. Oh, yeah. And and she Pete said, Martin. we just had her. Yeah. Pete, who lost over, like, you know, his X amount of weight. All these people lost substantial amount of weight will say the same thing. I would buy that program over and over and over until I had no money left. And then I would put it on a credit card and I'd buy it again. I'd do, right? do it again. Because, you know, my fucking And those life. are the people that, again, did steps one through four. Of they acknowledged their self-limiting, self-limiting belief. They knew their value. They fucking took action. And they weren't afraid to fail. They weren't, and th- those are exact. Those are exactly why they bought the program, and they had the success they did with it. And this doesn't just apply to a workout program; this applies to everything. Right? right. This is this and, is a life. These are life and keys. When, and when we say is. four keys, we mean all four of those guys, because the people that fail, and, and I can see it right now, looking looking at a chart of those four keys, the people that fail or don't see that value, they might be like, okay, you know what? Uh, I I feel like I know my value, but they're too afraid to open the door. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, they might say like, I, I'm a, you know, like, I know what I'm supposed to be, and that's not what I'm going to be, and I'm separating myself from that, but I'm going to get comfortable in this. It's not that, it's not what I was supposed to be, but I'm comfortable here, but at the same time, I'm afraid of failing, mm-hmm. you know, or I opened that door and I saw what's there on the other side, and you know what, I don't want to do that because if I do that, I might lose this, mm-hmm. and that's the thing. The four keys to making this possible. Are so important you need to follow all four and if you yeah. have all four you're gonna get the results you're going to become what you want to be yeah, and we put them in that order on purpose guys because you have to start by shattering your self-limiting beliefs you start you start there and once you've shattered those self-limiting beliefs move on to knowing your value understand what you're worth you have to be you have to be comfortable with yourself so understand what you're worth take fucking action kick that door down and then don't be afraid to fail so and we're not gonna say this is easy because it's not no God, making no. this kind of Action, taking this kind of action and making this kind of commitment is not easy. But then again, nothing worth having is. Right. You know what I mean? Like, and we're not we're not saying that this is going to happen overnight. I mean, sometimes, yeah, and a rare chance it can happen overnight. Like that that epiphany. But oh, yeah, like when I, you know, my favorite thing to do, Howard, is I go to the gym. I come home, I eat fucking brownies and right, 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 yeah, that's great. What happens the next day after I eat all that shit? I'm fucking shredded. And I put zero yeah. effort in. <laughs> Millennial bashing. Yeah. Millennial bashing. So what we're, I mean. It all boils down to you have to want this. You have no to decide matter that what you, you are. Do. You, yeah, exactly. No matter what you do, whether it be fitness, whether it be financially, whether it be emotionally, whether it be with relationships, whether it be with whatever that you're doing, you have to decide that you are worth this change that you can make possible. Right. So if it's fitness, understand that it's going to take about a year to get to where you want to be ideally or longer. If you want to be a firefighter, understand that you can't just be like, yeah, I want to be a firefighter, and all of a sudden you're fighting fires. No, it takes school. Yeah, you can't just go to Kmart and buy the cool hat. Right. It doesn't work. You know? Right. Sorry, guys. I want to be a doctor. Well, okay, wait, doctors don't just become do, doctors right? because exactly. they want to <laughs> yeah. They want to operate on people. Or they go I, through six to ten years of school to get there. Least, it takes least. work. So it doesn't matter whether it's wh- what career choice, whether it's a program, whether it's like, you know, a career choice it, or school. Or relationships or whatever. You need to go through 12 years of school for a reason. You know, you need to obtain knowledge. Things take time, guys. And you can't expect instant gratification. Nope. All right? You don't just get a 12 you know, year worth of schooling or a four year degree overnight. I, I wish there was a pill because I'd be, <laughs> I, I'd be overdosing. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't just buy the fucking Genesis program and get results in one day. No, no you, don't. So, you don't. I'm just going to end on that. If you're going to do the fucking program, do all 12 weeks and God damn it, give me your 100% all. Hey. You know, and here's the thing, guys. In failure, the thing that most people are afraid of and stops them from everything, I want you to take this acronym, you can look it up online, but fail. First attempt in learning. Mm. That's what failure means. Preach. So you cannot do not be afraid of the word failure or failing or the word fail. First attempt in learning. Like you that. need to right? fail good. Good to acronym. succeed. Good. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's let's leave everybody with this. When when Thomas said, Thomas Edison was creating the light bulb, he was very famous for it was Thomas Edison, right? Yeah, yeah, it was Thomas Edison. Yeah. He was he was known very well for saying uh, he, he failed. He failed a lot, and he said basically, I didn't fail a thousand times. I learned how not to make a light bulb. A thousand times. A thousand times. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Good. So take those four steps and run with them, guys. That is it for this podcast. We will see you next time. For more free information on fitness, nutrition, and bodybuilding, visit us at www.bodyspartan.com. I'm a man with a plan, understand.